Now, if you only know one dinosaur, odds are it's T-Rex. But not only was T-Rex weird for a dinosaur, this thing was actually weird for a Tyrannosaur. And here's why. The dinosaurs would still be famous without T-Rex existing, but this particular guy is a major contributor to their fame. Now, a lot of paleontologists view Tyrannosaurus rex the same way I do the beetles. Overhyped, but there's no denying their cultural impact. I know, I know, can we just agree to disagree? Part of this is the fact that T-Rex is a pretty small piece of the story for this whole group. Tyrannosaurids are a family of Silurosaurian dinosaurs, of which Tyrannosaurus was the namesake for. Remains were found as far back as 1856, but descriptions started with Edward Drinker Cope when he named Manospondylus gigas in 1892, but he didn't know what group this truly belonged to. It wasn't actually until 1905 that the group was defined when Henry Fairfield Osborne described for the first time Albertosaurus, Dynamosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus rex. He gave the namesake of the group to T-Rex, because, well, I guess he knew an icon when he saw one. But it turns out that Dynamosaurus and Tyrannosaurus were actually the same animal. Now, despite the fact that the type specimen for Dynamosaurus was technically found first, the rules set out by the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature state that when this happens, the name that got published first take priority. Now these were published in the same paper, but Tyrannosaurus appears on the page just before Dynamosaurus. So that was the name that stuck. We were literally a couple of paragraphs from T-Rex not existing. In fact, if we stick as strictly to the rules as we often do, T-Rex shouldn't actually exist, and we shouldn't really be calling these Tyrannosaurs. Remember Manospondylus named in 1892? Well, it was found in the early 2000s that these were just more T-Rex remains. The Manospondylus was actually named 13 years before Tyrannosaurus, so we should actually have a Brontosaurus type scenario here. But this was an occasion where the ICZN rules were a bit bent. They knew by this point how deeply rooted in pop culture Tyrannosaurus Rex was, and decided that on this occasion, the more popular name should stick since announcing that T-Rex never existed and that we should be calling it something different would cause more trouble and confusion throughout the world than it would were. Though it does still remain a controversial decision. But many more members of this group have been found over the past century and a bit, helping us work closer to completing a picture of these animals. Now a quick bit of housekeeping on wordplay. I'm going to be mentioning Tyrannosaurines, Tyrannosaurids, Utyrannosaurs and Tyrannosauroids. Now this is explained a lot more in my fossil grouping video, which I keep meaning to refilm because believe it or not, I sound so much more cringe than I do even now. But Tyrannosauroids is a super family that contains a few groups, including the Utyrannosaurs, which is a clade that contains a few groups, including the Tyrannosaurids, which contains two subfamilies, one of which is the Tyrannosaurines. Still with me? Okay, good. Many Tyrannosauroids are mistakenly referred to as Tyrannosaurids, such as Guanlong, Sinotyrannus, and Utyrannus. But I'm going to be focusing on the Tyrannosaurids for this video. Besides, I've already spoken about Utyrannus here. So, what does it take to join the Tyrannosaur Club? Well, members of this group were generally large theropods, with the smallest one causing some controversy, but since Nanotyrannus was officially crowned as its own genus and not just a juvenile T-Rex, paleontologists are now discussing whether to class this as a Tyrannosaurid. If it is, it shares joint first as the smallest Tyrannosaurid alongside Allioramus, both of which grew to be around 5 to 6 meters or 16 to 20 feet long and up to 700 kilograms or 1500 pounds in weight. Going through to more typically sized Tyrannosaurs, members such as Displetosaurus, Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus grew to be around 8 to 10 meters long, or 26 to 33 feet, and between 1.7 to 3 tons, before we get to the Asian Tarbosaurus which hit lengths of around 12 meters or 39 feet long, and a weight of 4.5 to 5 tons, and the largest at up to 13 meters or 43 feet long, and nearly 9 tons, was Tyrannosaurus rex. Have you heard of him? So the size ranged quite dramatically, but even without a sense of scale, picking out Tyrannosaur is actually pretty easy. In fact, picking them out from other Tyrannosauroids is pretty easy. Whereas most Tyrannosauroids were more gracile, 
full-tiered head crests and even three-fingered claws, Tyrannosaur Rids mostly had more robust bodies or very lanky legs, famously small two-fingered claws, and a skull that you just couldn't miss. And the old Tyrannosaurid kept some form of crest, such as Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus, but they all sported massive skulls relative to their body size. Like, really bloody huge. These skulls were tall, robust, and built to take inordinate amounts of stress. They were very box-shaped, especially when looking at the skull from the top, giving them some of the best binocular vision in the non-avian dinosaur world, especially when compared to the V-shaped skulls of other theropods. Despite the robustness though, they were relatively light with cleverly placed large fenestrae that didn't compromise strength. Another diagnostic feature for Tyrannosaurs is also what is known as a neutral crest, which is a raised bit of bone right at the back of the skull that wouldn't have been visible in light. And then we get to those jaws. Tyrannosaur jaws had a characteristic swoop on their maxilla, making it look like the upper jaws are sagging and these jaws were filled with huge teeth that, unlike the blade-like teeth of other theropods, were thick and D-shaped in cross-section, being built for crushing nothing less than bone. Now all these features in their highest exaggeration can be showcased in the main man itself, T-Rex, which I do talk more about here. Another thing I talk about is integument, and I recommend you get your hard hats for the comment section here. So, as a group of Silurosaurs, feathers are actually ancestral to the group of Tyrannosaurs, much like hair is to mammals. On Tyrannosaurs specifically, many have been observed with evidence of what is dubbed proto-feathers, which are long filamentous structures that would have given the dinosaur a fuzzy appearance. The larger members of the Tyrannosaurids, however, seem to have shown a secondary loss of most of their feathers, with the distribution of scaly skin impressions from a T-Rex specimen showing that they were mostly scaly. Now this doesn't mean that they had no feathers whatsoever, but large tyrannosaurs likely had tiny filaments in such a sparse distribution that, without inspecting closely, they would have appeared scaly. But yes, your childhood imaging is safe. For now. So what's their story? Well, where tyrannosaurs originated is another point that paleontologists have kind of flitted back and forth on. The group was widespread across North America and Asia during the late Cretaceous. The earliest tyrannosaurids were from North America, but the wider group of tyrannosauroids can be found in all continents across the Northern Hemisphere, with their origins being unclear. Now, I think it's important to look at North America at this time. This was cut in half by a warm, shallow sea known as the Western Interior Seaway, with Appalachia to the east and Laramidia to the west. Now, in Appalachia, we see tyrannosauroids such as Dryptosaurus and Appalachiosaurus which are the closest tyrannosauroids you can get without being an actual tyrannosaurid. But the only tyrannosaurids found in North America are all found on the Laramidia side, which, believe it or not, connected to a nice little land bridge between itself and Asia, which was cut off from Appalachia. Now this means that tyrannosaurids evolved after the formation of the sea, but the fact that they're more closely related to the Appalachian tyrannosauroids than to the Asian ones, it seems to imply that this group started out in North America and radiated out to Asia, with one or two lineages either staying behind or backtracking to give us guys like T-Rex. This theory has also been backed up by the recent study naming a new species of Tyrannosaurus, T. macraensis, or T-Mac. You know, now I think about it, I don't actually think I've ever seen one alive. Yup, many species came and went over the years, but this entire group came to an end 66 million years ago when the famous KPG event occurred, wiping out the non-avian dinosaurs along with around 75% of life on our planet. Which brings us to the end of the Tyrannosaurs story and quite nicely into the Q&A segment. So today's question comes from Josh the Mighty 9967 who has asked, What caused the Jurassic... Jurassic? Jurassic money, baby. What caused the Jurassic to a Cretaceous period extinction event? How many Jurassic period dinosaurs succumbed to it and did any survive into the Cretaceous? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, okay, so a misconception is that the geological periods in Earth's history are actually bookended by mass extinctions. And this is only kind of half true. They're actually defined by major organism changes around the world, which is normally caused by a mass extinction, but not necessarily. Now the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary isn't actually thought to represent a major mass extinction event, and it's 
actually thought to be more of a transition event. Or at least it's not fully agreed upon that it is an extinction event. In fact, scientists can't actually agree on where to put the boundary, since major groups show these transitions at various times, including marine ones, as this was something that all of life felt the effects of. Uh, as to what caused this, I think the most likeliest explanation is the breakup of Pangaea, uh, which I will be doing a video on soon, uh, but this would have changed the chemistry of the oceans, uh, this would have changed the weather, and it also would have isolated land masses, which as we've seen with Australia, can have vast effects on the life there. Basically, the animals that are alive at the time are mixing genes a lot less of each other and also having to adapt to different environments, so they're all evolving in different ways. Basically, most major groups of dinosaurs survived into the Cretaceous, depending on what scale you're looking at it from, but what made up those groups changed quite a bit. So sauropods still survived, but you no longer had most of the diplodocids and brachiosaurs and instead had more titanosaurs. But to be fair, sauropods did decrease in diversity since the Jurassic. You also had Thoriophorians that survived, but instead of being made up of stegosaurs, they were actually made up of ankylosaurs, etc. But we do see quite a few new groups pop up that weren't directly competing with any other group in particular, but they did come along thanks to new niches opening up. So this is where we see Ceratopsians and probably the biggest one being the diversification of theropods. So Lurosaurs, which are a group of theropods like I mentioned earlier, diversified massively during this time into Dromaeosaurs or Raptors, Tyrannosaurs, Ornithomimosaurs and a little group called Birds. Anyway, I hope that's helped answer your question. Uh, do let me know down below if you want me to expand on anything. And if you would like your question answered, please be sure to drop it in the community post on the YouTube channel rather than down in the comments below because otherwise I'm not going to be able to keep track of everything and a lot of people are going to get missed out. But for now, I will catch you guys next time.